Hi, everybody. How's it going? Good. Well, just looking forward to this weekend. Now, where in the world is Luke? Well, he was setting up a board in the hallway, like one of those unpork boards. Mm -hmm. Probably just putting that stuff away. Because I definitely saw him bring me a note earlier. Oh, yeah. He's here. Okay. Um, how about Bree or Alexis? Bree and Alexis are also here. Alexis and Bree were setting up a board. Yeah, they were true. All right. Well, let's see how that goes. All right. Um, so, as a reminder, last time we talked about the test format, right? So, when is the chapter test? Wednesday, Wednesday right? So next time, just uh, grab that stuff. Drop that in. Okay. Um. Any chapter seven questions here, kind of before we move forward, Nathan? Give us the law of science law for a test. Boom. That's okay, homie. Okay. Um, So that's that. Today then, um, since we objected to the test being today, which is totally fine, no worries to that, um, we're going to start uh, the next sets of stuff, which is um, what we're going to call supplement A. And in supplement A, we are talking about um, solving systems of equations. So here we're going to be talking about solving um, linear systems by graphing. So this is a recycled Algebra 1, Algebra 2 topic. So we're going to see this again here. Uh, let's start first by just going and defining what we mean by a linear system. So a system of two linear equations consists of two equations relating variables x and y that can be written in the following form, ax plus b, y equals c, and then dx plus e y equals f, where a, b, c, d, e, and f are all just constants. Usually we add like a little squiggly, a one-sided squiggly bracket like that to indicate that those equations are true simultaneously, that they have to both be true at the same time. So what does a system or a solution to a system of two equations look like? What does that mean? Well, C 
solution is just some xy that satisfies both equations. If you think about that graphically, an xy that's on line 1 and an xy that's also on line 2 have to be at the intersection of the two lines. Does that feel okay? So let's go ahead and um, do a quick example. Although I guess since we're doing it graphically, we're not, it's not really quick. But we'll do an example here. So say we have the system 4x plus y is equal to 8. And then 2x minus 3y is equal to 18. So I'm going to plot or draw the line for the first one in red. And I'll draw the line for the second equation in blue. Um, to write an equation, or write to graph an equation for a line, how many points do I need to plot? If it's a line, two. Two points will define a line. So I can pick any value of x, plug it in and find the value of y, or I could pick any value of y, <coughs> plug it in and find the value for x. So I would start by picking 0 for x. If x equals 0, what does y have to be to satisfy that equation? Four times zero is, so y equals eight. Everybody good with that? The next thing that I would do is then I would try picking y to be zero. If I plug that in, what does x have to be? Two. Two. Everybody happy there? I am often a fan of just trying to pick the values that make the mental math easy. All right, so I'll do the same thing here. So I'll pick the value of 0 for x. What does y have to be then? Close. Negative 6, right? When you divide 18 by negative 3, you should get negative 6. And then we'll pick 0 for y. What does x have to be? <clears throat> positive 9, right? 2 divided by 18 is positive 9. So that's everything I need to draw my graph. So I'm only going to worry about the first quadrant because everything is um, positive. Okay, so I have 0, 8, and then 2, 0. And ideally, I would use a ruler to do this so that it's like really nice and accurate. But um, then I have 0, negative, oh, I do have a negative number. Fiddle poops. So I have zero negative six and then nine zero. So I have that. God bless you. So if I took a look. This appears to be my solution. What is this value? 
Well, I think that's three, three negative four. Everybody buy that? Use the graph paper on your OneNote. It makes this much, much easier to have the graph paper in there. Now, can I check this? Sure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my first equation and I'm gonna plug in my value for x and my value for y and check to make sure that it satisfies that equation. 12 minus four is eight. Everybody agree? Yeah. And I'm gonna take my second equation. Plug in my values for x and y. And that works as well. 6 plus 12 is 18. So I am quite certain that that is my solution. Hi, guys. Hi. Is everyone okay with what I did here? So we just graphed the two lines, found the intersection, and then checked to make sure that our graph was correct or that our estimation from the graph is correct by plugging it into both equations, making sure that they are both satisfied. So far, so good? Okay. So if I think about a system of two equations, there's actually three possible types of solutions that can happen. Well, one type we've already seen where you get exactly one solution, or just like two lines intersect, right? Where I have that, that's our solution. Everybody cool with that? What else can happen? If you have two lines, they can intersect once, what else could happen? Brett? The lines could be parallel, what would that mean? Means that they don't ever intersect, so we'd say, well, not undefined, not zero, but no solution, right? If they have no intersections, then there can't be a solution, right? There's no x and y that's on both lines. There's no x, y that satisfies both equations at the same time. There's no solution. Great. Now, there's one other thing that could happen. One solution, no solution. What's the other possible? More than two. Three. More than three. Infinite. Infinitely many solutions. Yeah. What is that going to look like? Exactly right. If the two lines coincide, where one line is just the same as the other line, every point on the line is a solution, right? If the two lines are the same line, any point on either line is a solution, right? Because all points are the same points. So can I figure this out 
or can I predict which outcome I'm going to have just based on the slope and the y-intercept? Yes, I can. Great. Um, so let's start with the easiest one, infinitely many solutions. So let's say M is the slope, M1 is the slope for the first equation, M2 is the slope for the second equation, and B1 is the y-intercept of the first, and B2 is the y-intercept for the second. Sure. What can I say about the slopes and y-intercepts for the infinitely many solution situation? The slopes have to be the same. And the y-intercepts have to be the same because it has to be the same line, right? They have to be identical. How about the no solution situation? The slopes have to be the same, but the y-intercepts have to be different, right? How about for one solution? The slopes just have to be different. So if I rewrite my equations into slope-intercept form, I can immediately tell which situation I've landed in, right? Doesn't tell me what the solution is, necessarily. I mean, in these two cases it does, but is everybody okay with that? So let's look at an example. So let's say we have the system 4x minus 3 equals 8 and then 8x minus 6 equals 16. Immediately, Mr. Kula can see what the answer is. <clears throat> Notice how equation 2 is twice equation 1. If I multiply 4 by 2, I get 8. 3 by 2, I get 6. 8 by 2, I get 16. What is that going to tell me? That is the infinitely many solution situation. If, Sophia, this was like 15, where the left hand, I can multiply by 2, but I can't on the right hand, that's the no solution situation where half of it works, but the other half doesn't. Or you can, there's there's a factor for the variables, but there's not one for the constants. Okay, so they like have to line up. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Is that okay? Now what else could we have done here? We could rewrite these as slope-intercept equations, right? It's accomplishing the same thing. So I can subtract 4x from both sides and then divide both sides by negative 3. So same idea, we'll subtract 8x from both sides and then divide both sides by negative 6. And I notice that 8 sixths reduces to 4 thirds, and 16 sixths reduces to, oops, that should be negative, reduces to 8 thirds. And these are the same, right? Now, which was easier? 
I'd rather just look and see if one equation is a scalar multiple of the other. That seems way easier to me, yeah. and it's accomplishing the same thing. But I wanted to point out, too, that you could do that as well, right? Let's look at another example. Oh. All right, let's take a look at this. Again, immediately from looking at this, Mr. Coolit can tell what situation we're in. Notice the left-hand side for equation two is equal to four times the left-hand side of equation one, but the right-hand side for equation two does not equal four times the right-hand side for equation one. You see that? If I take this side, I multiply the top by four, I get the bottom. But if I do the same thing over here, it doesn't work. Everybody agree? So what is this telling me? This is the no solution situation. Correct. Again, if I wanted to, um, I could go and rewrite this as a slope-intercept equation. So the first one, all I have to do is subtract 2x from both sides. For the second one, we'll subtract 8x from both sides, and then divide by 4. We notice that the slopes are the same, but the y-intercepts are different. Those are parallel lines that are non-coinciding. That means no solution. Again, which one would Mr. Kulik rather do? Should he just rather look at it and be like, that's a scale factor, but that's not a scale factor, right? Is everybody okay? Liv, you're good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, the trickiest thing here in this first section is going to be dealing with these kind of story problems. But this is a good thing to kind of go and review because these sorts of things are very common, like, ACT kind of questions. So let's do this story problem. It says you ride an express bus from the center of town to your street. You have two payment options. Option A is to buy a monthly pass and pay a dollar per ride. Option B is to pay $2.50 per ride. A monthly cost or monthly pass costs thirty dollars. After how many rides will the total cost of the two options be the same? Well, let's first start by identifying our variables. So What's going on? We ride the bus so many number of times, and we're going to get a cost for that, how, many, how much it costs to ride the bus that many times, right? So our variables, I'm going to use R and C, R being the number of rides. and C equals the cost. Everybody's okay with that? I used R as my independent variable because clearly the cost 
depends on, I'm sorry, the number of rides is my independent variable because the cost depends on how many times you ride the bus, right? Okay. So option one, my cost is going to equal the monthly pass plus one dollar per ride. Everybody okay with that? So five rides I would have paid thirty-five dollars, ten rides I'll have paid forty dollars, fifty rides I'll have paid eighty dollars. You guys kind of get the gist? Okay. For option, oh I guess we call these A and B. Option B, there's no monthly cost. but I pay more for each ride. And we're interested in when are these two costs, costs the same. So what are we really doing? Solving the system, right? Um, I'm just trying to think of the best way of getting some points out of this. Let's do this with our calculator, huh? Might as well do that. Show you guys how to use your calculator to find an intersection. Absolutely. Why does Mr. Kulik think this problem is a particularly good one to use your calculator on? Well, like, think about how many... Think about how many rides you potentially would need to take in a month, like 30, 40 rides. That's a lot of lot of tick marks on an x-axis to make and stuff. It's just like the numbers are getting kind of annoying looking. Um, all right, so equation one, I'm going to use y for my c and x for my r. Again, we said r was the independent variable in C was the dependent variable, so hopefully that's pretty natural. And the second one, I just have 2.5x. Now I'm going to go set a window. R is the number of rides in a month, right? Can R be negative? No. So like, let's make zero the minimum for our x. And how many times would we potentially ride the bus in a month? I mean, I would say 60 is probably a reasonable upper bound. If you're riding the bus somewhere and then back every day, that's 60 rides. That's probably a decent upper bound. I don't know that we're going to be riding the bus, taking multiple bus trips in a day. Um, the Y is our cost. What's, can our cost ever be negative? No. no. So the decent lower bound for that is probably zero. And the most our cost could be, well, I don't know. Let's just put 200 or something there. That feels like way more than we possibly need, but good enough. Now I'm going to change these scales. I'm going to change the X scale to be tens. And I'm just going to change the Y scales to be like, I don't know, uh, 50s or something. Just so that I'm not like my X and Y axis have some tick marks on there, not just like overloaded. So here's, huh? Yeah, and the, and the Y scale is just means like, see the tick marks down? Sophia, you see the tick marks on the X axis or the Y axis? That's just saying they're happening every 50 units. So it doesn't really matter what that is, but if I was like going to try to estimate a value here, it helps to have some sense of like, how much is that? Now, I'm not going to bother to estimate because my calculator can actually find the intersection here specifically. To get that, I press second and then the trace command up here on the home row. And from these options, I want intersect, shockingly. Now, the intersect has three options. It asks us what two lines are we finding the intersection of and then to give me a guess. How many lines did I plot in here? Two. So... And how many times can two lines intersect? So all I'm going to do is press enter three times because it's just going to line one, line two. I only have two line options. Anywhere on the line is a decent guess because I can only get one intersection out of it. 
look at the bottom, it tells me that the X is 20 and the Y is 50. So when you ride the bus 20 times, the cost of the two plans are equal. If you ride less than 20, which option should you take? Option B. If you ride at more than 20, which should you take? Option A. Everybody feel okay with that? Yeah. And again, um, just from looking at the graph here, so option B is the one here. So as long as option B is below option A, option B is the better deal, right? Notice that they switch at the intersection after that. Option B is above option A, which means option A would be the better deal. Does everybody kind of see from the picture? Not too bad, right? That's section one. How do you guys feel on that? That's pretty easy stuff, right? Very kind of self-obvious. We're going to do one more section. We'll call it good for today. So in section two, we're going to talk about graphing systems of linear inequalities rather than equations. What's inequality again? It has the alligators in it, right? So our definition for that means... So unlike a, a linear system of equations, where you just can have two equations, a system of linear inequalities can have lots of inequalities. So you could have, you don't need to have just two, you could have three, four, five, ten, 10, 100. That is all okay. Um, so for example, here's an example of a linear system of inequalities that has three inequalities. So before we can talk about this, a linear or system of linear inequalities, let's talk about how do we graph a single inequality. Okay. So this is a four-step process. Again, at one point we knew how to do this, but let's review how to do this again. So to graph a linear inequality, the first thing you want to do is you have to rewrite it into slope-intercept form. Okay? What is the big thing that we have to be careful about when we do that? If you divide an inequality or multiply an inequality by a negative, the inequality symbol switches direction. Oh, is it that time? Okay. Off. So we're talking about uh, solving a system of inequalities graphically. Um, to do that, we have to graph these inequalities. So we're just recapping how to graph an inequality from your Algebra 1 or 2 class. Um, so you start by putting your inequalities into slope-intercept form, and then uh, making sure you're careful that if you divide or multiply by a negative number that you flip your inequality symbol. 
Then we need to draw the inequality on our graph. So again, we would graph the inequality just like we'd graph a line. So like plot some points. <clears throat> and the thing we have to remember is for less than or greater than, so we use a dotted line. But for less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, we draw a solid line. And then we do our shading. So to tell which way you should be shading, whether you should shade above or below, you just pick a test point on either side of the line and then plug that point in and see if it shade or uh, if it satisfies the inequality. So if we're doing this for a system, what we're going to do is we're going to graph all of our inequalities and we're going to shade the overlapping region. So let's take a look at um, a couple of examples here on how to do this. So I'm going to graph the first inequality in red and the second one in blue. So my first step would be to write the inequalities into slope-intercept form. Well, hey, that's already done for me. So now I'm just going to pick some values for x. So if I pick x to be 0, y is negative 5. Now I'll pick another value for x. Maybe I'll pick negative 4. It doesn't really matter. If I plug negative 4 and I get 8 minus 5, which is 3. Usually when I pick my values, I try to pick them kind of far apart. So I tend to get a better picture. It's a little easier to draw my line if they're not like right on top of each other. Uh, so here I'll pick x to be negative or to be 0, y is going to be 3. Maybe I'll pick negative 3 for x and then y should be 0. And now I'm going to go ahead and draw my graph. So 0, negative 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then negative 4, 3, 1, 2, 3, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. And then when I draw my line, I know I'm going to need a dotted line. Oops, dotted line. And since it's greater than, I know I'm going to be shading above, so I'm just going to do like a little arrow there to remind myself which side of the line I should be shading. And I'll draw my other line, so 0, 3, and then negative 3, 0. And this one should be a solid line. And because it's a less than, I should be shading below. So what part of my picture is below the blue line, but above the red line? It would be this part of my graph. Everybody's cool with that. What that means is if I pick any point 
from this region, say like 0, 0 is in that region, if I plug 0, 0 in, I'd have 0 is greater than negative 5. Well, that's true. And 0 is less than or equal to 3. Well, that's true. Any point from that region will satisfy both inequalities. So that's like my check. What do you think? Should we do another? Yeah, yeah I think so too, right? Yeah. But again, realize that your answer for this is the picture, right? There's not a numeric answer for this. Really, every, you know, none of these uh, systems of inequalities, the solution is just going to be like one point. Right, it's going to be like no points or infinitely many points. All right, so let's do this one. We have, oh no, three colors. So I'll do red, green, and blue. Now, first thing I'd want to do is rewrite these so that they're in slope intercept form, but they're already in the slope intercept form, so I don't really have to do anything there. So I know this is going to be drawn with a dotted line. I'm going to be shading below the line. So I'll pick some values for x. Maybe I'll pick 0. If I plug 0 in for x, I get negative 5. And then maybe I'll pick another value for x, maybe 4. Uh, 2 times 4 is 8, and 8 minus 5 is 3. So when I draw my blue line, I know I'm going to need a solid line, and my shading is going to go above the line. It's solid because it's the or equal to inequality, and it's above because it's a greater than. So I'll pick some values for x. So maybe I'll do 0, gives me 8, and maybe I'll do uh, 3, that would give me negative 1. And then I'll do my green one. So again, solid because it's the or equal to, but I'm going to be shading below because it's a less than. I'll pick some values for x. So I'll do 0, which gives me 2. And maybe I'll do 4, which gives me 0. Does it really matter which points I'm picking, though? No, I'm just trying to pick stuff that's easy for me to do in my head, just stuff that's convenient. All right, uh, let's go ahead and draw ourselves a picture now. All right, let's see. Uh, Um, red, so 0, negative 5, and then 4, 3, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, and this is dashed, and we're shading below. And then the blue one, I have 0, 8, and then 1, 2, 3, negative 1. That's a solid line. And we're shading above.
and then we got to do our green one. So that's 0, 2, and then 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That was solid also. And this one we are shading below. So I am looking at this section right in there. Don't, Duan? I picked it. I just picked something that looked convenient. I try to I try to pick them so that there's a little the X's are a little bit further apart. It usually makes it easier for me to actually draw the graph, but technically it doesn't matter. Any po two points are fine. Is that? Yeah, I just pick something where the number. I didn't want the number to get too big, so since I was like, you know, I had like two times X minus five, I'll pick a number. A kind of a smallish number for positive number for x because I'm going to subtract 5 from it so it won't be too big. I just don't want to have end up like, oh, I have 6, 400 or something. It's like, oh, this is just a, you know, like I'm just going to pick something that's not a hassle. Um, what do you guys think on this? Is this okay? Yeah, it's not so bad. Um, so you guys should be able to do like one through eight at this point. And we're gonna stop here and we'll take the remainder of our time. You can work on the homework you can work on your note card for chapter seven test. Um, you can take a brain break. You know, just try to be somewhat productive with our time, okay?